Welcome to the recorded version of Understanding the Emotional Aspects of Caregiving, part of the Family Caregiver Support webinar series brought to you by the American Society on Aging and a generous sponsorship from Home Instead Senior Care. All right, our presenter today is going to be Molly Carpenter. Author, speaker, trainer, and family caregiver, Molly Carpenter brings years of personal and professional senior care experience and training to families dealing with dementia care. In her current role, Molly works with a team responsible for ensuring that the Home Instead Senior Care 60,000 caregivers worldwide have the resources necessary to effectively provide quality care in the home and understand the importance of their work enhancing the lives of those they serve. Molly holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Family Science with a Gerontology Specialization from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and a Master's degree in Education with a Gerontology Specialization from the University of Nebraska-Omaha. And with that, I would like to welcome our presenter, Molly Carpenter. Thanks for being here today, Molly. Thank you, Steve. And thanks, everyone, for joining the call today on this Veterans Day. We appreciate your attendance. And we've got a pretty good session today, if I don't say so myself, because I know this whole webinar series is about supporting that family caregiver. And we talk a lot about the emotions of family caregivers throughout this whole series. But today, I want to go a little bit deeper on why some of these emotions are there and why um, caregivers are feeling how they feel. And I think that's probably obvious to a lot of us, but there's actually some interesting theories behind it that we're going to get to today. So thank you all for joining. Let's start by looking at the objectives on the next slide and really cover what we're going to talk about what we're going to cover today. Now, when we talk about caregiving, we know that this is a challenging role. I bet a lot of you on the call today are you work in settings where you are caregivers by profession, and you know how challenging it is, and we know that families have challenges as well. We know that this is an emotional experience, even when we think about professional caregivers and our family caregivers. So those of you working day-to-day -day with seniors in a professional role, you've got a lot of emotions too, and this is just as hard for you as well. So we're going to talk about a lot of those emotional aspects today. and. Um, I think, like I said earlier, I know a lot of us understand why, you know, this is, it's a hard role. It can be sad to watch somebody decline. You know, there's a lot of things going on there, but I hope for the next 60 minutes, we're really going to get deeper and to understand more what's behind this. And when you hear some of these different theories and different things that are out there, it's really going to give you some insight in supporting families who are caring for an aging loved one. It also helps when we understand some of the different theories behind this that it gives us a better, another way to talk about it with families, another way to explain some of their emotions. We're also going to look at um, some ideas on how we can help family caregivers manage their feelings because it's a very, very important part of this. And I know this is probably our biggest challenge is actually getting caregivers, including you professional caregivers that are on this call, getting you to really manage feelings and take care of yourself. It's so hard, but we have to keep working at it. We have to keep talking about it. So we're going to look at that today as well. And then um, we're going to discover resources like we always do. We always have resources at the end. Um, we've got a couple new ones up this year, and hopefully you're going to get some new resources to share with families as well. So I want to start on the next slide with really understanding why caregivers are experiencing this emotion. And like I said, it seems like this is a no-brainer, right? It's a hard job. There's some physical labor to it. There can be um, some stress around managing multiple families trying to get everything done and like I said it's sad to watch somebody decline it's and you want to remember them how they used to be so there's tons of emotions happening but there's an actual theory that has been developed to really help explain this a little bit further and this theory it's very it's pretty well known it's been researched for over 20 years and it's called the caregiver identity change theory this was developed by Dr. Rhonda Montgomery and Dr. Carl Kozlowski. And the theory basically is explaining the caregiving journey, that it, it, it is a journey, and there's a lot of systemic changes along the way. There's changes in activities or some of the tasks that people do. There's a change in the relationship 
with the care receiver. So there's obviously the biggest example we can share with that is there's, a, there's an increase in dependency. And this in turn causes a change in the identity of the caregiver. It changes who they are. They're changing from one role to another. So changing from spouse to caregiver or daughter to caregiver, for example. So the caregiver is going through a set of changes, and it's a gradual change. And I want to look at this gradual change on the next slide. I've got um, a graphic to kind of explain it and show it to you all on the next slide. So in this example, I'm using the spouse to caregiver example. The blue um, on, the, on the rings on the picture on the slide really is the caregiver and the other role that the person plays is the spouse, that sort of beigey cream color. So you can see in phase one, there's a, there's a little bit of caregiving happening when, when a spouse becomes a caregiver. And it, and it gradually changes, you can see, all the way through phase five. And what changes along the way are some of those activities that we talked about. So for example, when you think about spouses, and I'm going to I, I'm picturing a couple I know in my life that is going through this. So I'm picturing um, a male taking care of the female spouse. And this gentleman um, is cooking dinner now. And he never used to, his wife did all the cooking, you know, for all the years that they've been married. And so this, this gentleman is now faced with these different tasks and activities. And it's new. It's a new set of activities and a new set of role. And it's really interesting and and hard for somebody who's never had to cook before to start cooking. So think about that. So in this theory, the main goal or outcome is that we need to fix that discrepancy that the spouse is faced with. So there's a couple of ways that a caregiver can go. Number one, the spouse can maintain their role. So they can stay the spouse and not become the caregiver. Believe it or not, I know this is hard to believe, there are, that is an option for people. I know we never talk about it, it doesn't actually happen very often, but there is a choice there. And that choice would require some outside help, which is where a lot of you guys are gonna come in with your roles. There's another, another option here, is you embrace the caregiving role, meaning you come to terms with it, I'm gonna be a caregiver, and that's going to be my main role now, and I'm going to give up some of that identity I have as a spouse. Okay, that's going to go in the background, or that's not going to be my primary role in this relationship anymore. Caregiving is going to be my primary role. There's also the role, and I, I hope this is what a lot of caregivers do or eventually do, uh, I guess it's a choice, not a role, is they find a balance meaning they come somewhere in between phase three or phase two and three, where yes, I can do some of the caregiving roles. There's a lots of things that I want to do that I'm comfortable doing because I love myself and I want to help out. But I want to be the spouse still. I still want that role. I don't want to change the role. So I'm going to have to get some outside help with the caregiving parts of this job now or this relationship now. So. Where the stress comes in for, for family caregivers is when it's when their behavior does not match their current rules of their role. So like this gentleman I'm talking about, he's all of a sudden having to like prepare, you know, cooking's one thing, but figuring out what to cook, finding the recipes, going to the grocery store, all of those different behaviors that he has to do, that's not in his current role as spouse. He's not used to it. There, so there's a struggle of, I don't want to do this, or I'm not good at this, or I don't know how to do this, but now I'm faced with doing this. So there's this in, internal struggle, and that's where all these emotions are coming from. That's where those periods of stress and distress come in. And this is where a caregiver needs to step back and determine, how am I going to handle this? And this is where you guys come in with your help. Our, and you can help them understand Am I going to stay a caregiver and learn how to cook? Well, then guess what? I'm going to have to learn. I'm going to have to go to a cooking class, or I'm going to have to pick up a, an easy-to-read cookbook. I'm going to have to do something. I'm going to have to buy my meals. I'm going to have to do something, right? Or um, I'm going to have to um, get some help to get a cooking service in to help me because I don't want to do that, and I can't do that, and I'm just not built to be a, a chef, so to speak, okay? One of the most fascinating points about this theory is that this explains 
that it's really not what they're doing, it's how they feel about it. So think about that. I think a lot of people can take on some of these things. They can take on um, the role, and I, I bet a lot of you have this example of the male spouse taking care of a female spouse. I have a, lots, of, lots of couples in my life that I've cared for over the years that have gone through this, and it's not, they don't mind bathing a, their wife or, or helping their wife get dressed, the physical task of that, but what they don't, what is so hard for them is how they feel about it. Now they're taking care of this person and that is their spouse. So this, this theory is trying to explain what is happening in the relationship and why that things are happening in the relationship. And so I, tell, I share this with you today because I want you to gain that insight. I want you to gain the insight so when you're talking to families and family caregivers that you can understand and help them realize this is a journey and this is phases. And I think when we understand why, I mean, I'll tell you guys, when I learned about this theory and really took it to heart and I understood that it was, now I understood why I felt so different or why things were changing, why I was having all these emotions, it's sort of like a light bulb went off, like, oh, okay, so number one, it's natural to feel this way because my role is different. So whenever anything changes, naturally we're going to feel a little weird or different because our role is different. It also normalized it for me, like, oh, this is common. This is what happens. And it also gave me the permission that I actually did have a choice, that I'm not a bad person because I was uncomfortable with this change or this in this role, that I'm not a bad person. It was just, oh, I either have to decide – I'm going to go with it and I'm going to be this person and I'm going to change or I'm not I because I don't want to. I just want to be the daughter, for example. Or in my case with my grandmother, I just wanted to be the granddaughter. Yes, I helped a lot with caregiving, but there were times where I was like, you know, when she moved into the nursing home, I absolutely could have done a lot of the extra care, but I didn't. I called the, the nurses and said, you know what, I'm a granddaughter right now. That's what I, my role is. I want to be the granddaughter. I don't want to be the caregiver. And that was okay. So anyway, I spend a few minutes on, these, on this theory and, and on these couple of slides because I really want you to understand more about this and how when we present this to families, a lot of different aha moments go off. And so it's just, it's just kind of another talking point for all of you as you're um, talking to families about these different emotions. So let's look on the next slide and start looking at some of the emotions that people are feeling along the way. Now, at Home Instead Senior Care, we conducted some research and we interviewed over a thousand caregivers um, in North America to really understand how caregivers are coping. And as you would expect, the interviews confirmed that individuals caring for a senior parent or an older family member are experiencing a lot of different emotions. And the good news is, is that a lot of them were positive emotions, such as love and tenderness and gratitude, you can see there on the slide, appreciation, and even a sense of accomplishment, which was really pleasant to hear. However, some caregivers, especially those who had um, some different challenges like dementia or Alzheimer's that spend more time, they tend to experience more difficult emotions. And, and you can imagine what those are, and those are frustration. Um, anger, overwhelming, feeling very overwhelmed in a day. And so how we think about our feelings can make a big difference. Many of us believe that feelings such as love and tenderness are good and anger and frustration or resentment are bad or wrong. Now this can complicate things because we may feel guilty about the emotions that we shouldn't feel. How many times have you talked to a family caregiver that says, I feel guilty because I'm overwhelmed. I feel guilty because I'm stressed out and I have to ask for help. Well, um, the thing about emotions is we've got to take off some of those adjectives about them being good or bad. Emotions just are emotions. And I know that's a hard mind shift to get around. Um, it's really hard for me to still get around, but it's true. If we stop kind of categorizing emotions and really just start to think about that, it's just an emotion and go from there. It may take away some of that feelings of guilt and frustration from these caregivers. 
Now, um, caregiving is similar to a lot of other life events, like a marriage or children, and it can bring up conflicting feelings. So emotions that accompany caregiving are usually intense, and people are often caught off guard because they haven't planned for this, or they, or they become a caregiver without a warning. You know, something bad happens, or a, somebody falls, and then, whoops, all of a sudden I'm a, a full-blown caregiver. Okay? And um, think about this. I thought of this example. When somebody is a new mom or, be, or is pregnant, how, there's a million books out there about how to get through pregnancy and what to expect when you're expecting. I know a lot of you have seen that book. And you're basically for nine months you're in a zone where you're preparing to be a mother. You're preparing to be, quote, a caregiver, right? Well, that doesn't happen when, it, when it's with the senior loved one always. Yes, there's some great resources out there, and that's hopefully what we're all out there to do. But that doesn't always happen. And so think about how you know, there's a gap here when it comes to senior care. We don't have a lot of this prep work that we, ahead of time, it just sort of happens all of a sudden. So again, with talking about that caregiver identity theory, it's our role to help them reconcile or help them embrace this role or get support as needed. Okay, let's look at the impact of the emotions caregivers, caregivers are experiencing on the next slide. Now again, this is according to the research that we did that caregivers are struggling with the difficult emotions and sometimes when they have those emotions, they repress them and this can obviously have some negative consequences. And um, we know that 44% of caregivers caring for someone with Alzheimer's repress their feelings and 64% of those individuals who provide 20 or more hours of care per week are feeling overwhelmed. So 20 or more hours a week, that's a lot of hours. And when that's kind of an interesting threshold, though, to think about, if you can keep that in the back, in your back pocket, when you see a caregiver who keeps providing more and more care, you know what's going to happen. You're going to get the phone call where they're very overwhelmed and they need help. So when caregivers are feeling more anxiety, it's, it's usually due because they have difficulty watching their loved one decline, which we mentioned earlier. They're all also feeling anxiety because they may not, they feel like they're not doing enough. They may not be present all of the time. So how many times I've witnessed this with my family, with my grandmother, um, we're there to help her to do the caregiving tasks that we set out to do that day, and we're not even present while we're there. We're just doing the tasks and moving on to the next thing because we have a hundred other things to do. I'm completely guilty of that one. And that leads to anxiety because you kind of realize it later on in the day, right? So that's another reason why caregivers are feeling this anxiety. And a lot of times caregivers are feeling anxiety because they feel alone and they might feel some stress in other relationships in their life, like a marriage or, or a siblings or daughters and sons they have. When we talk about frustration, where they're feeling frustrated is the increasing demands on their time. This can be physical demands. It can be... Um, like I said, just the time that they're having to spend on caregiving. They also are feeling frustrating because um, of not being able to control emotions and they're feeling like they do not have that support system. So these are all some of the responses we heard when we did this survey of when you say you're feeling frustrated, this is why. So when we get to guilt, this guilt comes from wish they could do more was a common response we heard. Um, they're feeling guilty because they lose patience with their loved one or they're missing time with their own families, okay? So uh, when we think about some of these emotions, boy, um, anxiety, frustration, and guilt, those are three tough ones. And I know I'm, I just said we shouldn't be judging emotions and we should not categorize them, but um, anxiety is a, is a tough, is a really hard emotion to manage. So. Um, I just I share this with you to give you some insight about some of the responses that we heard. But again, see how hard it is to change how we talk about emotions. It's even hard for me. Okay, let's look at some of the health impacts on the next slide of emotions, when especially when we repress these feelings. Now, these are some of the percentages that we saw when we did that survey. 
and they refer to the number of caregivers who say they have experienced specific physical or health-related changes since becoming a caregiver. And so we can see that a lot of people are experiencing fatigue, and we can see when they repress their emotions, 74% so they experience fatigue, but when they allow their emotions, 60% uh, are feeling that fatigue. Now, I, I can't tell you why that is the case. I can theorize, though, and one of my ideas around that is when you are repressing emotions, I know for me, if I'm having a day where I've got a lot of things happening and uh, some different emotions, it's hard for me to get sleep at night. So I imagine that it has the same kind of effect here where if we're repressing things, we're not we're not understanding why our emotions are there, we're not getting it out, and so we are tossing and turning. And that goes back to the difficulty sleeping there as well. We're not really getting out um, those emotions. And when we allow them, we're kind of breaking free and we're figuring out why we're having them and then we can move on to solutions. So that's just one of my thoughts on that one. I'm, I'm not, uh, again, we'd have to ask more questions on the survey to get the real answer around that one. Um, we also look at the depression. Look at that one. Caregivers who hide their emotions are 2.3 times more likely to have experienced depression and two times more likely to have experienced high blood pressure since becoming a caregiver. We also know that according to research, this survey and if you look in the academia world research, caregivers do have some of the higher diabetes rates and the higher cholesterol. And they have increased risks, they have increased risk for doing some of those um, poor behavior choices like smoking and alcohol use and not taking care of their health, that's probably the biggest risk um, when they're having, and so that's why we're seeing some of these more chronic conditions occurring because they're not taking care of themselves like they should and, and taking care of their health because they're taking care of other people, right? So um, to really help caregivers manage their emotions um, and avoid jeopardizing their health, We've got to help them feel better about their caregiving journey. What can we do? Let's start to look at some of those techniques on the next slide. Now, this is general. There's, there's four things that we've got to help family caregivers do, and we're going to walk through these one by one. But they are we need to help them acknowledge feelings. We need to help them release those emotions. And when we release those emotions, we can help them find solutions, and then we, again, need to help them engage in enjoyable activities. So I want to take a closer look at each one of these more in depth, and I want to start with acknowledgement on the next slide. So we'll go to the next slide and start with acknowledgement. And in the average day or week, caregivers can experience that, that range of emotions. So from love, appreciation, satisfaction, to anger, resentment, frustration. And so it's really important when that we help caregivers accept their feelings, both the positive and negative feelings, okay? And avoid judging themselves harshly for feeling the way that they feel. Again, that goes back to emotions are just emotions. Maybe we take it away from positive and negative emotions. They're just emotions. And we have to avoid feeling that we're a bad person if we have anger or frustration. So I think that that's an important step when you're talking to caregivers is help them to just acknowledge these are emotions and we just have to figure out that they're, we know they're there and the real key is to figure out why they're there, okay? As professionals, we really can help caregivers, you know, be, be aware of these feelings. We know this journey is several phases. We also know that it's going to constantly change. Right, this is one of those relationships when you're a caregiver, it's, it's constantly gonna be different. It could be different every day, especially somebody with Alzheimer's disease or dementia. And so once we help caregivers acknowledge that, it kind of normalizes their feelings, reassuring them that many people feel the way they do, kind of bringing light that this is because um, their normal role or their identity is different now and it's okay. One thing that I've heard, uh, I, I think I've, I've learned it from somebody, one of you all in the field, 
at some point is to help caregivers to look at their feelings as a pie. So picture a pie. And you use this to help them determine where they're at in their journey and kind of get creative with dividing up emotions. So perhaps 30% of the pie is anger, 20% is guilt, and the rest of the pie is love. And so you're basically saying, look, it's okay to have a little bit of this and a little bit of that because most of the pie is love. So I've, I've learned that from one of you all in the field here. Um, for a great way to explain to family caregivers. And I've actually used that in some of my talks that I do across the country, and it people nod and resonate with that kind of a scenario. And so I think it's okay that when we use the pie example, it's that we're experiencing all of those emotions at once. You know, it's just how we cope with it. And they also we have to look at the situation of, of helping caregivers understand what they can control. So, for example, if the the person is a diabetic, if the care recipient or the aging loved one is a diabetic, we can, as caregivers, probably control the food that is served. We cannot always control what the person eats, though. We can encourage and we can be present during the meal, but we cannot force feed people and we cannot make them, you know, eat a certain way. We can provide the best, best food and the best options, but we can't force it. So just helping caregivers understand what they can and can't control and to be realistic about the situation is very helpful. Okay, let's talk about release on the next slide. The second strategy to use for caregivers is they need to release their feelings in a safe way. There's a lot of things that caregivers can do to, to release these feelings. And I, of course, am a big advocate for journaling. I'm also a huge advocate for a support group, but there's lots of different ways. And you can see some of the examples on the slide there, a therapist or a non-judgmental friend, just somebody to listen. You don't actually need answers. It's just somebody to listen. I think exercise and meditation, yoga, any of those types of things are such a huge release of stress and negativity. And nobody ever did exercise and afterwards said, oh, I regret I did that. You just automatically feel better after some exercise. And exercise naturally enhances the mood. It relieves stress. It builds strength. You know, it does all of those things. You guys know me. I'm a huge advocate for exercise as well. Uh, many caregivers also find prayer brings relief. So these are some things that we can share with them about releasing. I actually think it just depends on the person. That's why we have to have these options in our toolbox because, and it, it could depend on the day. Sometimes I feel like journaling. Other times I just want to go run on the treadmill. Sometimes I want to call my best friend and just vent for a few minutes. So letting caregivers know that it's okay to do this and they've got to have these options in their life to help release some of those emotions. So again, as professionals, we our big goal is listening here and listening to some of those, um, pick up on some of those trigger points on what people, when you're listening to caregivers, what they need, um, helping them understand the negative consequences to the stress if they keep it in too long and if they carry it too long. Like I said earlier in the opening, this is the hardest part for caregivers. They don't understand that they are no good to others if they are not good to themselves. And so even starting by taking 30 minutes a day or 15 minutes a day is if we can encourage a caregiver to do that much, they'll already start to feel that benefit of that like 15 minute break or 15 minute release and they'll see how important that is and then build up to the 30 minutes and then maybe an hour. So I can't t stress that enough that we've got to take time for ourselves as caregivers. We've got to help our caregivers give them permission to take that time. Okay, finding solutions is the next strategy. So let's take a look at that one more closely on the next slide. Now, when we think about caregivers, there's, there are some solutions that they can turn to. Hopefully they've got some siblings, maybe they have extended family, some friends, neighbors, um, the faith community. It could be a good resource. And so I think this is one of those options when, again, as professionals, when we're talking to families, that we 
invite them or, or remind them like these this is these are some great solutions. You need some extra help. Here's some ideas to start with. And I know we've talked in past webinars about, you know, when we involve siblings and neighbors and friends, people want to help. We just have to give them a task to do or give them um, something that would help relieve stress and or help relieve the caregiver's stress and it can be very beneficial. Now that's where you guys are probably going to have to help caregivers coach and ask around help. Um, ask, ask, help them ask for help. It's really hard to do. And so even by saying to them, um, picking a couple of easy things like go doing the couple of errands that, you know, the caregiver needs to do, that's super easy to ask somebody to run a couple of errands. And your friends and families, they always want to help. We know that. They, and it's even better if we can give them a specific job to do. I think also um, you guys are really good at already at coming up with different resources and re making referrals to people and sources and community um, programs that can help the caregiver. So I think another big thing for all of you professionals out there is um, I know we, I tease a lot and I tell you guys are all therapists because you kind of are. It's, it's really a part of your role, I think. But even you don't have to be a therapist. You don't have to be trained. It's even just a lot of listening. It's even pausing and asking the caregiver, um, where is this emotion coming from, do you think? Or wh why are you feeling this today? And once just asking that question can help you lead to the solution and, and you guys look like heroes when you do that. I think a lot of times um, we get a family caregiver who's just talking, talking, talking and they're just telling us everything that's wrong and everything that's happening and if we can just, you know, pause and listen and then pause and ask the question, why are you feeling this today, might help us gain the information we need to offer a solution. So just something to consider. Okay, let's look at the final strategy on the next slide, and that is engage in enjoyable activities. Now, I know we talked about some of the release options around journaling and support groups. That's releasing emotions. Once we've helped caregivers release that emotion and find some solutions as to why they're feeling that emotion, we still have to go one more step and encourage them to stay engaged in activities that they love to do. Um, they can't abandon their life because of their caregiving duties. And so I love, I'm a big um, advocate of making lists of things. You know, on a list, I cross off things off a list. I love to make lists. So asking caregivers to list the things that they enjoy, just a simple list, and having them do it as an activity. And maybe it's, you know, all those different things on the slides. And then you challenging them to take a few minutes a day to do one of those activities at least. And again, just like we said, start with 15 minutes. Build up to the 30 minutes or the, and to the hour where they're getting more and more breaks. And as professionals, you know, a lot of you, this is, you know, when I think about what you do day in and day out when you're in the trenches, in the field, working with seniors, um, it's hard work. Even if you're not doing the physical care, to be in the environment, into the healthcare environment, it is hard work. And all of you I know, know how important it is to take time outside of work and recharge your batteries. So as professionals, you can you can naturally encourage the families to do the same thing. You guys are almost in the same boat where you you guys know that, you know, I I work um, or I live pretty close to a, um, a restaurant that also is a, is a sports bar and the hospital is a few, literally two blocks from this location. And I see professional nurses, they come in in their scrubs and they're, they're having lunch together and they're laughing and just having a good time and it's just it's just one thing they do to recharge their batteries and take a break from that very stressful hospital job that they have. So you guys are used to doing that or, or hopefully you're used to doing that and so you can help, you can use, share your message that you do in your job with the family caregiver as well. Understanding and helping them understand that's not selfish, it's just recharging. That's, I love that word recharging. 
um, it really can give them great ideas and really provide that positive reinforcement that it's okay to recharge and that we've all got to do it. Okay, I want to show you on the next slide some of the stats from people who do not get help. So this is again from that research that we did. And when we look at this, there's many reasons why caregivers do not get help. And I, you can see them on the slide. One of them, I, I owe it to my parents. You know, they took care of me my whole life. We've heard this a lot. Or it gives me satisfaction to help, which is great. Um, that's okay too. That's where we have to watch that person that says that kind of response of, are they still doing enough for themselves though? Or I feel I can give them better care. This one comes up a lot when I, the example of the male spouse, I've had several, several male caregivers tell me that exact, um, tell me that that's why they don't get help is because they know they can give them better care. And that's true to a certain extent. Nobody can give the love and, well, I guess I, I, I almost might take that back. Um, I've seen a lot of in, in the caregiving world, whether it's a professional caregiver in a home or a professional caregiver in a facility, um, I've seen those caregivers give tremendous amounts of love. But I think that that's what that family caregiver is trying to express is people can't do it how I do it or I know I can do it better, which, you know, there's, we want to acknowledge that, that they're doing a great job, that there is still opportunity for help. It may not be in the care, but like I said, it could be, that's, that's the person that it could be the errands, running errands and different things like that. Parent refuses outside help. I've heard this a lot. That's definitely one of the reasons why people don't get help. Um, and it goes along with trusting outsiders. I think when that is the reason, I think that's a situation to start very slowly, whether, and start with a, a simple task like um, running to pick up prescriptions or running to the grocery store there and back. You know, something simple before we go full blown, slow, full blown into major care, major help that way. So as professionals, we can really help, help people understand that the goal is to see that their loved one gets the right care and they don't have to do it all. You know, they, they don't have to be the Superman. And we can encourage people to see professionals and, and other family members and other services in the community as a team and help caregivers understand that they're not a failure by getting help. I go back to the gentleman who doesn't, isn't the cook and he doesn't want outside help. He just, it's, he just doesn't want it for his spouse. But when we present Meals on Wheels as an idea to him, this, this all of a sudden didn't seem like, oh, okay, that, that is, it didn't, it seemed, it was outside help, but to him, it was such a burden to be able to having to cook all the meals, that just by having the noon meal was going to be very helpful for this gentleman. And we presented it in a way of, this is a team approach. You can't do it all. It's, it's hard for anybody, it's hard for your spouse, it was hard for her to cook breakfast, lunch, and dinner all these years. So she just did it, she's just excellent at it. So um, that's kind of how we explain it, and that, that sometimes if you can handle the dinner meal and, the, and to do the breakfast meal, let's, help, let's have somebody get the, the noon meal for you. So using that team approach really was beneficial for this gentleman. Now, um, you guys have so many resources out there. And so when you're, by understanding more about the emotions and the experience, you can really help even more families by breaking down that barrier of not getting help. And on that note, let's look at the last slide and talk about the resources on the final slide. I know a lot of you have uh, tons of resources and lots of things in your tools, toolbox that I always call it. But there's, here's a few more. Um, the caregiverstress.com is a great website. And when I give you guys like caregiverstress.com, yes, that's a site that you can give to families directly to go look at. But as professionals, you can go to this site as well. There are so many downloadable free resources there. Download them, hand them out, use them, whatever you need to do. Look at this 
caregiverstress.com for all kinds of different resources, safety checklists and, and you name it. There's like lots and lots of resources there. Same with the Alzheimer's Association. They actually have quite a bit of free content and free downloadable information as well from, um, you know, uh, different, like I saw a great form there not too long ago about questions to ask the doctor. Uh, so when you're going to the doctor's office, here's some questions to ask, and it's a form. So you can actually print it out and use it and take notes on it. Um, AERP has a wonderful caregiving resource library as well. Um, that's actually a site, that it's got lots and lots of information. It, every time I go to it, I find a new resource I love on that site. And that is one I actually would give directly to a family as well. I'd actually give all three of those directly to a family, but I think that, um, again, as professionals, you can go on and get pretty familiar with these sites and pull out some great resources just to use in your everyday um, dealings as well. And then ASA recently did a blog article about the 25 organizations that take care of caregivers. I thought this blog article was fascinating, and if you go to the ASA's website, which I know you're all on a lot because you're on these webinars, but go and Google that blog and pull up that list of organizations, and it's, it's 25 organizations, and so by the time you get through the list, it's, it's a lot of information, but just get in the habit of even once a week going to one of those new sites, that, one of those new organizations either that you haven't worked with or that you haven't heard of, and explore some of the resources. Explore what they're doing for family caregivers. Learn about new resources that these companies offered. Um, learn about ways, you know, the, this, this list of organizations, they, there's a, they're from all different disciplines and all different types of resources. And so you may come across an organization that can help with something that you didn't even know this resource existed. So I encourage you to, uh, if you just Google in the ASA website, 25 organizations that take care of caregivers, that was the name of the blog, your list will populate. There's links directly to those organizations. And again, I feel like that is a list I have handy with me all the time. I tell families I, I use a lot of those organizations on a regular basis. So again, I encourage you to look at that and get some, some good notes from that. So I just, before we get to questions, I just again want to thank you all for taking the time to come on the call today and learn about the emotions of caregiving. I know when this topic Maybe when you saw it, you thought, I already know about this. I already know about the caregivers have a lot of emotions. I'm hoping today, after learning a little bit about that caregiver identity change theory, learning that this is natural and learning that when somebody's role changes, there's an internal conflict, and that's completely natural. Just learning all of that information might give you some more insight when you're talking to these families to help them understand that it's okay and that this is what's happening. And I think when we bring that kind of awareness to families, number one, you all look like heroes. You already are heroes, but to a family, you're just going to look even, even more like a hero, even more important than what you already do. But by helping them understand that, it's just the insight that they need to move ahead and make decisions, make choices, and and be good at this role or, or, or manage this role and manage all the emotions in this role. So again, I thank you so much, Steve. If we, I would be happy to answer questions now. I'll turn it back over to you. Okay. Thanks a lot, Molly. Great presentation. We really appreciate it. And if you are ready, we will get to the questions. Okay. First question here for you, Molly. You were talking about those male spouse caregivers earlier. The question is, what is a good way to address those male spouse caregivers that say they can give the best care and so they don't hire outside help or care? You know, that's that's a great um, question. And I got to tell you, it's one of those um, it's one of those challenges I've I've faced so many times in my life in in this job, and it's it's very hard. So I, I guess my first answer is, there really isn't a silver bullet answer to this. I think um, 
what I what I've done in the past, I'll share with you a story. Um, a gentleman who was a prominent doctor in my community, and whose wife had Alzheimer's disease. And this was when I worked at a senior living community, and he he probably visited me about a dozen times before he actually moved his spouse into this facility because she was get, needing total care. And I think one of, there was a lot of things that happened to this gentleman along the way. Number one, he was having that internal struggle, which I wish I would have known about this back then, but he was having that internal struggle with becoming a caregiver versus being the spouse. That was one thing. But I think the other big thing that was happening, because he said to me, I do the best job, nobody else can do what I do. I would actually usually agree with him about that. But what I had to do was, number one, he had to learn to trust me, and he had to learn to trust the staff in the building and learn that they really do love seniors as well, and they love to do this job every day. And yes, the, the, they may not do it as good as him, but they would, be, they would be very, very, very close to being second best, if you will, so to speak. And what happened was the way we got him to understand that was we really explained that we tried to get to know your spouse very, very well, and we do that with your help. And actually, we want you involved in the care. We want to learn from you what you do that's, that's different and better. We want to learn what she likes and doesn't like. We want to learn... You know, if she does get upset, what do you do to help her calm down? So I think that we have to, um, it's, a, it's a trust relationship situation, this scenario is. And I, again, there's, there is no, quote, what I call a silver bullet because every male spouse I've interacted with has been a little bit different. Um, it's, it sometimes is a pride thing where they're admitting they can't do something. And for a gentleman, especially this gentleman, who was a, a prominent, well-respected doctor in our community, he could not admit that he needed help and wanted to help. And so, again, I don't have a, an answer except if there, the answer is there's no – there. It, this takes time. And it's one of those situations that's just going to take a little bit of time to get through to the person. But that doesn't mean give up. Um, so I, I know that you're frustrated with it, and I understand that, but it's just going to take a little bit of time, and the rewards will be very beneficial. i got to tell you, um, just to follow up to that story, he did move his wife in. She was the most lovely lady, and the staff, everybody loved her, you know, like they loved everybody pretty much. But when you when you work in an Alzheimer's unit, there's a lot of love there, right? So, um, But this gentleman, he changed. So he still came and visited his wife all the time. However, he would started to go on more longer trips. He would he liked to travel and he would go on trips and he was a big golfer. I'll tell you what, he the color came back in his face. His he put a little bit of extra weight on, you know, cuz he had gotten so skinny. He was walking differently. His walk was different. His voice was different. This man actually, you know, after six months or it might have been a year, he came to me and said, this is the best thing I've ever done because um, he was a better person. He felt better about everything, and he saw how happy his wife was, and he knew that he was kind of admitting, I couldn't have done this. I couldn't have done this without the help. I, you guys are, were the right people that I needed. I needed help, and I couldn't have done this. So you wouldn't say that to me out loud, but that is exactly what he was saying to me, if that makes sense. I hope that helps. I'm sorry for the long-winded answer. It's just there isn't a, a, a quote, you know, do this, and that's what fixes it. It's just a hard conversation, and it takes a while. And I think understanding what the pain point is is the key. So understanding um, is it a pride thing? Is it a, what is it? Is it a embarrassment? What is the emotion the person's feeling? And then we chip away on helping them understand that that's, that emotion doesn't need to be there. There's some things that we can do, so to speak. Okay, great. Um, next question here for, for you, Molly. What are some effective strategies for reducing tensions between family caregivers and professional caregivers 
that arise from conflicting expectations and modes of caregiving. Oh boy, that is a great, great question. And it's, um, boy, I've seen that a lot. I've seen, that's a pretty common, um, that's a pretty common situation, I would say, where, um, yes, families' expectations are uh, different than what our expectations are, what's happening inside um, a facility or a senior living community, so to speak. Um, I think the biggest thing is is that um, I, I know there's usual check-in points, care planning meetings, or and even if it's in assisted living, there's opportunities where there's scheduled like quarterly visits or whatever they are. I think that's really the time and the place to have that conversation and really understand. Again, when, when here in my experience, when expectations are off, a lot of it's because of the emotion the family caregiver is feeling. Right? It's, it's everything we've talked about today. They're feeling guilty because they're not the ones there. They're feeling guilty because they didn't make it there this week, or they didn't do X, Y, and Z. So there's. That that's when I mean we got to have these little check-in points so we understand why the emotion is happening. What where is this coming from? A lot of times we tell stories to ourselves like, "Oh my gosh, this family was so rude today. I can't believe they did this," and um, blah blah blah, whatever you know. And then they just left, and that was terrible. And so we kind of make up a story about what just happened, even though we have no idea what's happening. And the same goes for the family. You know, they 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 do the same thing to us on this professional side as well. They'll, um, well, I just saw her and she was just standing there. She wasn't doing anything. When really, I've seen I've seen this happen in person. I had a nurse next to me one time, who was standing there and she was just, she just had a terrible rough situation with a with a senior, and she was just standing there taking deep breaths. And she was just standing there. And I heard a family member across the hall say, look at her. She's just standing there. She's not even trying to help when really she just needed a minute. So, again, we, it happens on both sides. So there's some touch points or this, these check-in meetings where we everybody is honest with each other about what's happening and we really get expectations in check. I, 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 I can't, without knowing more about the situation, I'm – I would be guessing about what's off about the expectations, like what's the scenario. But these meetings, whether it's um, we're not getting mom enough, mom quick enough to the restroom, or we're not getting her to dinner quite enough, or she's not this or that, that's the point of these meetings. And and maybe you have to have them sooner. You can't wait for a quarterly touch-in point or the care plan meeting. You have to get them in quicker or sooner when there's a problem. That's that's probably my biggest advice is to nip it in the bud before it gets to be a problem. Everybody kind of get on the same same page. And so um, I the best answer is to just be open about it and just to talk about it and talk it through and really come from a place of what are your expectations? Here's where we're at. Let's see where how we can make this work. So I just think open communication is the key here. Okay, next question, Molly. How do we best deal with a situation where family caregivers will allow an outside caregiver in but inter are interfering with the outside caregiver providing that service? Um, I'm assuming we're talking about an outside caregiver to come into a facility and um, like a private caregiver coming into a facility or a different company. Um, and that's a tough situation. I definitely think that's a conversation that you've got to have with the, um, if it's the director of nurses, is that, if that's who in, who's in charge. I think that there needs to be a conversation um, about, and, and be specific. Again, don't tell stories. Don't make stuff up. Give, give facts. And when I say make stuff up, I'm saying we make it up in our head like, oh, this person's doing this and they're doing it wrong, or, you know, whatever. So I'm not saying so I'm, I guess what I'm saying is make sure you have some information about what's happened. I would talk to the supervisor, whoever that may be, and that's when the supervisor, if it's director of nurses or whoever, needs to either have a conversation with the private caregiver or the private caregiving company or whatever it is. But um, I always, in these kind of situations, I learned this the hard way. 
believe me, in my very, when I was in, um, just graduated from college, and my first job at a nursing home, one of my first jobs out of college at a nursing home, I learned this the hard way, that um, the caregiver that was coming in that was, quote, private, um, I thought they were interfering. And really, um, when you sit down and talk to the person, their heart is in the right place. They just misunderstood the protocol of the community. And so if we could just go into these situations thinking everybody's heart is in the right place, we all love this person and want them to get the best care, you'd be surprised how that can sort of um, take the emotion out of it and just find solutions as to what, what went wrong and how we can make it better next time or how we can, you know, reestablish the ground rules of what's acceptable and what's not acceptable as far as the, um, you know, interfering with care. All right, Molly, next question. Are there supportive ways to help families going through guardianship? And do you know of any websites to support families that are going through the process? Um, I don't off the top of my head know of any of those um, guardianship type of resources because what I always just use is my area office on aging. And I call those social workers and talk to them about what, you know, the steps and what do we need to do and, you know, who is um, in charge or who, you know, who can help in this situation. I will tell you, this is so, it's such an interesting question because um, I was just at a town hall meeting about a month ago and in my community there is a new group that is out to help senior, uh, help families go through this guardianship process. And it was a group I had never heard of, and, I, and it's a local group, so it's, I don't think it's worth sharing it with you all. But um, they—that is exactly what they're doing. They're helping this. They're helping families go through the process, which they put them in touch with a lawyer or a firm or some or the state and whoever needs to get involved on that level. But then they they are offering some supportive services along the way. I would challenge you to kind of do some looking in your community for some. Um, some of those specific resources. I'll, um, Steve, on the follow-up, I can send a note about what the what the group is here and their website. But again, I don't think that, I know it's not a national organization, but maybe if you guys had that information, you could kind of do some Googling in your areas to find out those, those resources. But it's interesting you just brought that up because when I heard this new resource, I thought, oh my gosh, I've got to go meet these guys and get a card because oftentimes I get this question with families going through guardianship stuff and they need extra support. And and I don't know all, everything that it entails, the support, but um, they just said that they're there to support through the process. And, and I think they, they mentioned paperwork support. They mentioned um, a couple other things, but I can't really remember in their introduction. So anyway, I, I don't know the national organization Perhaps check that list I just told you about through ASA. They There could be a guardianship um, organization on that list. But I would just start asking around, and I would start with the Office on Aging and ask them if they've got any additional resources or know of those types of resources in, in your community. Okay. Well, Molly, we have reached the end of our hour here, and we are just about out of time. But I want to thank you for being here today with us and for a fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, and thank all of you for coming today.